So for the next hour and a half, we we'll have ten presenters that are going to talk about the new extension in web computation CV, and that will be each of them between five and ten minutes. So they will be good, but even if they are not, it won't be long. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name's John and I work at an organisation called Future First. Future First is about helping state schools and government funded colleges to stay in touch with and to use their networks of former students in exactly the same way that private schools and universities do. Um, so one of the things that we provide is we allow teachers to, um, we, we provide a platform for them to log in and to stay in touch with and reach out to and engage their former students. So I just thought I'd quickly show some parts of it to you. Um, this is our search function. If you're interested in finding out more about it, it will be worth speaking to Parvez, whose team made it. Um, what it does is it maintains an account in the top right-hand corner, and then that changes as you select more and more options, and it restricts other options as well. Um, to allow teachers to get the most out of, out of their data. Um, we also maintain a communal inbox so that although teachers can email directly from themselves to maintain that personal touch, they can also um, see all of the emails that they have been sent by other teachers and that have been sent to them. We maintain uh, lists and different ways of allowing teachers to engage their former students. That might be appearing on a poster in the school, it might be fundraising or making donations. Um, our most common one is to get former students back into schools to inspire the, the students to understand that people like them go on to be very successful as well. Um, and this is something which I'm really pleased with because we developed this in-house with the Future First team. Um, this is our way of allowing people to view and edit information about their different contacts and it all uses inline editing and um, all based off the CIVI CRM API so it's been really easy to develop and it's been uh, and the end result we're just absolutely delighted with. Um, teachers can filter by people who've signed up recently and by people who've updated their information recently as well. Um, they can add other teachers to the system and we also allow them to uh, we, we also provide um, a page on resources, and this is maintained entirely by non-technical members of Future First staff using Drupal content types and blocks. Um, so it doesn't have to go through the tech team just for them to be able to update it. We made it with a combination of Drupal blocks, Civi CRM extensions, and custom modules, and Civi CRM profiles. And uh, although it's been quite a lot of work to get to the state that it is now, it would be a lot more work if we weren't using Drupal and Civi CRM. So, yeah, we've really benefited as an organisation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk um, about some integration we've done um, to get Civi to accept Bitcoin payments. Um, just got some notes here, sorry. Um, so, what's Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a digital currency um, which uses a lot of the principles developed for peer-to-peer um, -peer file sharing networks to create a decentralized network. Um, the idea being that it can't be controlled or manipulated by individuals, governments, etc. Um, the software that um, runs it is also open source. Um, it's on GitHub, I think. So it's very much considered to be in the public domain, both in terms of the network itself and the software running on it. Um, it was designed by this um, mysterious figure called Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody really knows what, who he is. Um, um, it's actually thought to be a group of people. It's either a group of people or a genius who be, sort of seems to be an excellent economist and um, an expert on uh, cryptography, that sort of thing. So people think he's um, it's probably a group of people, but it's a mystery, and I don't know about you, I like a bit of mystery and intrigue. <laughs> so um, people have been dreaming about digital currencies um, since the 80s, but it's presented a lot of problems, the main one being that anything that's in the digital domain can be copied infinitely. So what's to stop you copying your money and spending it multiple times? But um, Bitcoin's found sort of a, a number of clever ways around this. Um, so we've been looking at it a bit at Circle. Um, we actually started off looking at something called Ethereum, which is like this crazy decentralized 
cloud computing smart contracts thing, which we didn't really understand. And um, the reason we didn't understand it is it's sort of based on a lot of the technologies behind Bitcoin. So we thought, oh, well, better go and find out a bit about Bitcoin first. So um, that's what we did. And then we started thinking, oh, well, has CVCRM got anything for this? So I had a look around and I came across this forum post. Um, it's, um, the EFF um, last year were trying to sponsor a project, I think. I might be wrong about this, uh, to get some students to implement it. And um, the forum post started off, um, hi, I'm such and such, I'm sort of a part of the student team implementing, um, working on the Bitcoin project. And first of all, I would like to wholeheartedly apologize for what happened on IRC the other night. And I thought, now what, what happened on IRC the other night? <laughs> <laughs> what, what did they do to cause so much offense? Um, but as I say, I like a bit of mystery and intrigue. Um, <laughs> But the Stanford students gave up on it. In the end, it's quite a, um, to be fair to them, um, it requires a non-standard workflow, which isn't really supported by CIVI. Um, CIVI tries to categorize payment processes into three main types, and it didn't really fit into any of these. Um, so we tried, tried to come up, um, tried to come up with a sort of way of doing this, a um, way of implementing it. Um, so yeah. Um, I will demonstrate. Um, I've got a, um, an event page up here with the, um, the Bitcoin, our Bitcoin payment processor <coughs> installed alongside some others. Um, if I scroll down a little bit. Um, yeah, it's actually BitPay um, we're using at the moment as a payment gateway. Um, so, um, um, but we've got plans to introduce some others at the moment. Um, so we've got this running alongside some other processes. You see, if I select another processor, um, the Bitcoin prices disappear. Um, they're actually calculated when the page loads at the, at the current exchange rate. And um, yeah, they've come back again. Um, so um, yeah, there you go. So I'm gonna go ahead and pay for this event. Click continue. Um, is that it? Oh, here it goes. Um, so, yep, there's the confirmation screen. Should be familiar with. It's also telling you the price in Bitcoin um, before you go to the payment processor. And then um, we set up this little payment page in Civi, which is actually displaying an iframe, um, the BitPay. Right. This is slightly annoying. When I first designed it, this iframe was much bigger and it looked, <coughs> it sort of filled the whole page and they've, they've kind of reduced the size of it. Um, it looks a little bit lost there, but we'll, we'll work out what to do about that. Um, right. So there's three, um, three ways you could um, pay. Um, you can scan this QR code with a mobile phone app. This will open up a wallet app on your mobile phone with the, um, with the amount pre-filled and so on. You can, uh, if you click the button, um, you need to have your browser configured to be able to open Bitcoin links. Um, I've um, um, got an online wallet here, which might, am I still logged into this? Let's see if I'm still logged into it. I am. So, what I might do here is, oh, no, hang on. Just one minute. I'm not that used to using Windows either, so this is an interesting experience. I want to get these sort of two windows here. Sorry. I'll just put the microphone down a minute. Sort this out. So, sorry. Um, yeah, so if I click this here, oh, it's gonna, oh yeah, this, this computer isn't set up to open Bitcoin links. I didn't think about that. However, um, what we should be able to do is um, copy this, copy this um, Bitcoin address here. Um, I'm going to send some money here. Uh, this is what you want to send it, and how much? Uh, how much is it? 
0 0.0001. Yeah, this change rate's a bit crazy. Okay, so I'm going to click send payment like that. Hopefully, there we go. Oh, I've overpaid it, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Too many zeros. That is, um, that is one of the problems, and uh, yeah, there you go. Um, trying to think if I was going to say anything else. No, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name's Neil Sharp, and I'm from George House Trust. We're a charity based in Manchester. This one not working there. We're a charity based in Manchester. We're a health and social care charity supporting uh, people living with HIV, providing advice and support um, and peer support predominantly. We um, have a very heavy volunteer uh, um, intake and we have around 150 active volunteers um, and we recently started using Civi Volunteer. We used Civi Volunteer to manage our whole of our volunteer recruitment for the four-day Manchester Pride Parade and we had uh, 53 volunteers over the course of the weekend covering a variety of shifts. Because I'm going to use our live database, I'm not going to be able to share those lists with you because they have names, but we link Civi Volunteer, obviously with events because it's part of the events module, but we have different type of events. If we're providing peer support groups for our service users, we'll use events for that. If we're holding our own fundraising events, we'll use Civi events for that but we'll also use Civi events if any of our supporters are holding fundraising events on our, on our behalf. Um, and we will create a contribution page so those people that cannot attend the event can actually make a donation on that contribution page but feel part of the event because it's all set up around that branding. Um, but also we manage the volunteers who will be attending that third party event on our behalf there. So if you can just bear with me while I bring up an event. I'll go on to say that we've used Civi Volunteer, uh, Civi CRM for just over a year, um, and it's made an absolute massive difference to how we manage our volunteers and indeed everything that we do at George House Trust. we managed to double the amount of people that joined us on the parade at Manchester uh, Pride by twofold. So we had over 100 people joining us last year, and a lot of that was down to having records of people that joined us in the previous year. So the event example that I'm going to use is an 80s night at Eagle. Eagle is one of the bars in, the, in Manchester's Gay Village who are a big supporter of George House Trust and need little excuse to bring Kylie and Jason out of the closet. <laughs> so this is the event. I've just robbed a load of text from our contribution page, but within the settings, there's the Civi Volunteer extension. Hopefully it won't take too long. I would sing JC on Jason or Kylie, but I'm not going to. You should be so lucky. Okay. So here we have volunteers. And Civi Volunteer allows you to define the volunteer needs, assign those volunteers that sign up to meet those needs and then the third stage after the event would be to log the volunteer hours that those volunteers completed. There is a beneficiary field down here which defaults to your um, default organisation but I use it for the venue that the, is holding the fundraising event. So we then start to build up a big picture of those um, venues that have hold fundraisers for us and we've obviously got a link between the volunteers that attended those events. Defining volunteer needs is fully configurable. So for this event, we need uh, people to give out raffle tickets and we need bucket shakers. And in this example, we need two of each. They're going to start at 8 o'clock 
uh, and work through till midnight. So there's in minutes, that's the length of the shifts. People sign up and join up to this event online. And if they're not particularly fussed whether they're a raffle ticketer or a bucket shaker, by ticking this box here, we allow service users to sign, uh, volunteers to sign up saying that they're flexible. They don't, know, don't mind which of those roles that they do. So if I just go into the event link. Back to this page. Please work. Here we go. So because we're not allowing registration to, the, or there's no need to allow registration to the public to the event, we, we haven't got online registration, so there's no register now button. But because we've activated CV volunteer, we can still volunteer now. So as a we will have sent this link out to our active volunteers. It won't go public. It will go to those volunteers who we know are trained and uh, OK to do this role. I'm logged in. So it's pre-filled my details. But I'm, say, I'm going to say that I want to be a bucket shaker. If we had multiple shifts for bucket shakers, then I would have had the option to choose which shift I wanted to do whilst doing that role. But as is the only the one shift, I'm going to submit my details now. I get a message to say that I'm scheduled to volunteer. Thank you. And if we go back into settings, the volunteer coordinator and also the fundraising coordinator will receive an email to be told that um, a volunteer has signed up. So now if I just go back onto the volunteer extension. And this time we look at assign volunteers. These aren't real people. We've got Ken Barlow and Ian Beale doing the raffle ticket sales. And you'll see that from the submission that I've just made, it's all automatically put my name against Bucket Shaker. And it's now telling me that one more is needed. What civic volunteer will allow us to do if we have a volunteer in the office offline and um, they want to do that role, we can just select the name from our list of contacts, add them as being available, and then I could drag and drop Susie into the bucket shaker. like that. So we're now full. We don't need any more volunteers. The, uh, the, the job's done. But we may still get people signing up, in which case we can just download a report, add them to the list of available volunteers, and then should anybody drop out, we can just uh, re-recruit. So everybody's had a marvellous time. Our buckets are full. And the following day, we can log the volunteer hours. So here we had the volunteers that fulfilled their roles. Everybody turned up on time. Everybody completed their four hours. We can copy that down as a batch and save it. And now all those volunteer hours are logged against their records. Um, and we can go on to produce various reports. It's made a huge difference to what we do and how we manage uh, our volunteers, and I definitely recommend Civi Volunteer. Thank you. Okay, guys. I need a mic, I guess. Okay, uh, this is a big deal today for my session. No code, no live demos. I will just start with a little quiz. Um, this is an income. Figure, fundraising income, donation figure. Is this a healthy organization? <laughs> what? It's growing figures. It's income coming up. 
so. Any board member I know would be happy. Yes. Yeah? But you are skeptic indeed. It's not a healthy organization because if you would look at the right KPI, and in this case, this is the net growth of donors coming in next to donors leaving the organization, you would see that in this case, the organization at first sight might look healthy, but in reality has some big problems in, in keeping there the donors. So for me, that's one of the big things in, in working with data and doing some business intelligence, as we call it. It's know the right KPIs and use the right KPIs. Some other stuff. Uh, as people might know, I'm a data miner fan. Uh, one thing we do is predictive modeling. It's trying to predict how people would respond in direct marketing actions, what people would do. The first thing I find quite interesting is the constatation we make that survey response by donors is a great indicator of future donations. If a donor at the beginning of being a donor answers questions to a survey you send to them, the average gift over the next three years tend to be quite higher than if they didn't, didn't answer the survey. Even if not all people answer the survey, it's a nice tool. So I would really commend, uh, recommend people do some surveys with your donors. Do invest in some development of CV survey to make that possible, okay? Next thing. Another thing you can see if you do some surveys is that people might be giving well, but might not really like your organization. If you do surveys and you combine information about how people tell about your organization and what people do, then you could segment your database in a totally different way. For example, in this organization, you see that they have a huge bunch of people answering in service, yes, I do like your organization, but there's another charity I like much more. That would be a totally different communication she would do to this group of persons than the group of donors saying in a service, you are the charity I like the most. I do support some others, but your organization I prefer more. So if you do surveys, you can segment much more better than just looking at giving data. What else we have? Classical thing, uh, fundraisers in the room doing street fundraising. Uh, There's a recent graph of Amnesty International showing the link between retention after people did sign up in the streets and the age. Conclusion, the younger the people are, the more recently they were born, the better their attrition, the more people leave. The big issue here is that we're mainly signing up young people. So if you combine those things, conclusion is give the instruction to your street fundraisers to recruit older people and focus spending the talking time on the streets to older people, not to younger people. So actually for the, for the people more in detail, I discover a gap between below 22 in the streets, even don't try to sign up people, they will leave too fast. After 32 years old, they are more stable and staying. And between that, you have a group. Yeah, sometimes they say, sometimes they leave. Okay, some other things. Uh, one of the nice things we do in data mining is, is in predictive modeling is we use this kind of nice uh, decision trees. It's deciding what combination of elements, characteristics of people who determine whether people stay or not. Yes, the reality is today in street fundraising, at the day of recruitment, I can predict whether people would stay within six months or leave with about 70, 80% of accuracy, looking at the combination of this type of data of persons. So if you know that, you can adapt your marketing strategy to whom you do some additional effort, to whom you even don't try to keep them. The only thing is for fundraisers, sometimes it's scary to really shift that uh, movement. But that's what it really means. If you look at data, you start to treat organizations or persons in a totally different way. I, time ago, I worked for a quite strict Catholic organization doing some, some data consulting for them. And I came up with this kind of stuff and saying, hey, you need to segment your data, segment your donors. 
And the president, the priest of the organization said, no, God created all people equal. We will not segment our <laughs> database. <laughs> it's a choice you make. What is also quite interesting to see in data is who are the persons who are really supporting, really contributing? You have this famous Pareto rule. 20% of the donor base contributes 80% of your money. To be honest, I don't know whether you checked it in your own fundraising databases. For fundraising, it's not true. For fundraising, it's more 10% of the people contributing 90%. Another nice thing, uh, in my session last day I, get, uh, I got some uh, questions about how I deal with missing data. It's a nice graph from another data mining guru in fundraising, Peter Wiley from the States. He discovered that if you have a phone number listed in your database of a donor, There is a big difference in the level of giving. If you don't have a phone number in your database, the chance that they will give about zero dollars is much higher than if you do have a phone number. Even if you don't use a phone, but do it by direct mail. And the more you, if you have a phone number, they will give more. The logic about it, if you have more data about persons, usually that means that you have a closer relationship with them. Last thing, I'm playing with telemarketing and predictive modeling of whom to call. The nice thing of telemarketing is it works quite well. It has some good results. The bad thing of telemarketing, it's costly, terribly costly. So the, the trick in, in telemarketing is calling the right people. If you don't do any data modeling to select people you call, you might have on average 2.5% of the people answering saying yes to the telemarketing. After some calling, you do some ad additional modeling, you can go up to 11% people answering. If you combine, I'm not that far yet with Amnesty, but if you combine, you can go up to 24% answering. The big deal is if you continue where you end up. And that's the thing about calling only those ones who would be able to respond or not. The whole thing what I'm trying to explain is that data and the technical stuff you do, do to put data into a database is needed to, to build your attention, to keep your donors, to make them satisfied and keep them on giving. And the reason of this is this. If you would be able to have 10% better retention in a database like this size, it would mean already quite a lot of money. So if you use your data to make people to stay, to get them to know each, each other better, then it's much more interesting. That's a big deal. We're talking about big data, we're talking about data-driven business intelligence. It's a new thing, everybody's talking about it, but nobody's really doing it. So my challenge to all of us here in Rome is let us make that, that teenage co dream come true. We can do it, we have the tools in house, we just have to play with it and you have to experiment it. I do it combining CV CRM with Rapid Miner, which is a uh, partly open source um, data mining software. But playing together and using the data, you can do a lot of things. Just to clarify what data driven is really about, for me, there are two key dimensions in being data driven. The first dimension is using the knowledge this, uh, in, hidden in this data. In the data mining community, we don't talk about data mining. We d talk about knowledge discovery from data. It's about understanding what's in your data. And that's about what is happening in the data. What are people doing? Who is doing what? Uh, what might be happening if we do that? It's about testing, split runs, analytics of, of what's happening. On the technical side, you need some visualization tools. Uh, you need some uh, testing, split run possibilities, analytics tools. A second thing, in, uh, yeah, and just to, to make that clear, in, there are different levels of doing so. The first level is just building reports, some basic figures, st statistics. The second level is doing some more in-depth analytics, really looking about the data. Okay, run, run, run. 
okay, skip, yeah, and then you can, <laughs> yeah, build it. The last thing, and you said I had to say that as well. Uh, the second dimension in being data-driven is that we go to a level of extreme personalization. We don't just do mass segmentation, we would really go one-on-one. -on -one. And that's about um, really fitting and personalizing document uh, uh, what we communicate to people. On a technical level, it's all about action triggers, merge fields, tokens, and stuff that yes, you need to build in in your systems to be able to do that. Um, and that's, that's, if we can really be personal, then you can keep people much more better with it. The, the big thing with it is a huge difference in the way we classically do marketing. In a classical way, you have an organization's calendar. Every second day of the month, we send out our newsletter. That's easy to manage. We can do it on our rhythm. If you do it on based on what a supporter does, when a supporter does, then it, it fits to his personality, fits to his rhythm of life. Sounds nice in theory, but that's a logistic nightmare. That means you every day you are sending communications and at the same day, day a people, person ex gets this ki type of communications and another person gets that type of communication and it's become really messy. So the, the importance of automatization and stuff, the technical stuff to make it work is really key in, in this and that's why we need developers and users together. Okay, Xavier is laughing at me, I really have to stop now. Hello, uh, my name is Alan Shaw, and I'm the senior developer at Emphanos. And I wanted to talk to you about something that we've uh, come up with to help some of our clients deal with managing contributions at the household level. We have, uh, this has come up, I think, for three different clients in the past three months. And um, the issue is that they're using households in their, data, in their CVCRM systems. And of course, households have members. And those people give money. And sometimes the attribution for the contribution, contribution may be attributed to the household itself. And sometimes it may be attributed to Mr. Or sometimes to Mrs. Or to someone else in the household. And that's all fine. And we recommend that people try to attribute things properly as they're actually given, right? If it came from the husband and the wife, then go ahead and attribute it to the household. If it's just one of them, just attribute it to that person. But we have clients who want to reach out to their households based on you know, the household's giving level. So I'd like to send a, an appeal to everyone who has a history of giving $10,000 or more but hasn't contributed this year. Well, we have households that may have given $8,000 for the household, and $2,000 for one of the household members, and $3,000 for another of the household members. That adds up to $13,000. But until we can aggregate that at the household level, we can't filter for $10,000 per household. So um, what we came up with is a simple report that does all that aggregation and then allows, um, allows you to filter those things out Based on, uh, based on those different types of requirements. So I'm going to jump over to uh, my, pers my personal site. This is the joy of touch typing on someone else's computer. Hold on. There we go. So right now, there's an extension called Aggregate Household Contributions Reports. And um, it's, uh, it's available right now with a release. And there's a readme file here which um, explains quite a bit about some of the unique features of this report because it can get a little complex. So rather than reading this out loud to you right now, <laughs> um, I can show you a demo report. Oh, I'm going to have to log in. Pardon me. Wow, yeah.
Okay. Okay, great. One second. Here's my demo report. So in this report, we just decided to look for people who have given over 45000 in their household, uh, at the household level, ever, um, but who haven't given in 2014. And there are actually two, and, and I, I tried to make it a short list so that we can look at some relevant examples here. Um, and just to, just to show you the results, we have here the Lochner household, which I'll open in a new window, a new tab. And we'll see that the Lochner household has $42,000 of contributions attributed to it. So the household itself is below that $45,000 cutoff. But if we look under relationships, we'll see that there are also people here like Jack Lochner. And if I open up his profile, then under his contributions, we can see that he's given a total of 10000 so together, the 10,000 from Jack plus the uh, 42,000 from the household add up to, help me out, 52,000. So that's why they're going to show here under Lochner household. And total contribution shows that total. Right? And it shows me that his last contribution, that somebody in the household last gave $425. Um, let me show you a little of how this works. Um, really quickly, I'll mention that Edna Howison here, you'll see that that's not a household name, that's an individual contact name. And the reason for that is because we still want to reach out to Edna even though she's not a member of a household. So we want her to appear in this report. So when it does the aggregation of households, uh, it treats, if there's an individual who's not a member of a household, it treats them the same as any aggregated household. So that they come out as well. And you'll see her total is $307,000, but her last contribution was in 2011, so that's why she shows up on the report as well. Here up at the top, um, this report has a some advanced features that are unique to this report, namely these different types of filters. So we have a total contribution filter, um, which I could turn off, and we have a last contribution filter, which I could turn off. So I have total, first, last, largest, and any. And right now, the results that you saw are based on this setting, total contribution filter, that is uh, completed contributions at any time, totaling more than, greater than or equal to 45,000, and also, um, their last contribution is before the beginning of, of 2014 in any amount. And so that gets us those people. Um, but with these filters, we can also combine things like first contribution, largest contribution, uh, and also people who have ever given any contribution along certain parameters. And um, by combining this together with tags and groups, we're also able to do or combinations Right. Um, and then I think the other, the other thing that's interesting here is that um, we have this total contribution column and last contribution column. And uh, this allows us to show, to, to, to decide what appears in that column. Uh, we could do, have it show a total of all contributions ever, or if I wanted to, I could have it show only contributions that were given uh, in the past two years, for example, right, with, by using a range. So that this, uh, this column here, total contributions, right now we've configured it to show total of all contributions ever, but we could also have it show how much they've given in the past two years or something like that. So that gives us a lot of flexibility uh, to filter and also to control the outcome of those, those columns. That's it. Thank you. Right, I'm going to log into my system and it's going to show a photo of me. That's the way the system was designed. Uh, it's not vanity on my part.
There we go. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about um, some email customizations we've done uh, for our fundraising. Um, and it's basically taking scheduled reminders, uh, which is built into the system, uh, and turning it almost to a marketing automation system. So uh, some of you may have seen the talk I did. We've launched our own fundraising pages, um, just like just giving using sort of personal campaign pages. And as part of the fundraising um, scheme for the London Bikeathon this year, which is a cycling event that we run, we wanted to introduce, in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, incentivized fundraising. So to encourage people to fundraise, if they hit certain targets, they get free stuff. So if they hit 100 pounds fundraising, they get a free cycling jersey or a free pair of shorts. Um, so what we needed to do is have automated emails go out when they hit certain points. So I renamed Schedule Reminders Automated Emails because it's not really a scheduled reminder anymore. Um, and we've done, we've done some extra work for scheduled reminders uh, so they can be triggered off different things. So ordinarily you can trigger uh, scheduled reminders. Oh, I can't change that one. I'll do a new one. I'll show you this one. Actually, no, I'll do a new one. I'm in a live system, so I don't want to uh, turn anything off I'm not meant to. <laughs> so within Schedule Reminders, you, can, you have different entities you can trigger off. And what we've done is add in contributions to be able to trigger off instead of just activities or just event registration. Um, so if you go to contribution, I can say, right, when someone pays by credit card, it's completed um, for the legacy campaign. And say the source was DFP, which is our fundraising platform. Um, that can trigger an email. And that can trigger an email to either the person who got the hard credit, which is the donor, or the person who got the soft credit, which is the fundraiser. Um, so you can build quite complicated uh, triggers for this stuff. So I can send an email to the person who's got the fundraising page to say, by the way, John's donated to your fundraising page. And I can send an email to John saying, thanks for donating. That's very nice of you, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you can trigger it. You can't have it before because it's not a time machine, um, but you can't get rid of that option. Um, it'd be great if it were, I mean, that's predictive analytics. If you can get on that, Ilias, then great. <laughs> um, so you choose when it's going to get uh, that. So you have some that go out to everybody. Um, so a thank you email, for example, will go out to everybody. But also we can add in uh, another layer, which is to filter by groups. So. I'll go to one that's there. So this is the Birmingham Bikeathon. Uh, it's saying when someone's hit 100 pounds. And this is where we need to add in the, the extra bit, is limiting it down to a group. So I can say select a group by limit recipients. I'm pointing on my screen, so I should be pointing up here. Um, I'll just do it with the mouse. Uh, so select a group there, and then you, s you can add in a group here. And we've got a smart group here. Um, and this is another bit of customization we've done. Uh, so the smart group, smart groups you can create off searches, so an advanced search, a custom search, whatever else. Um, so to be able to filter on the things you need to, you need a search to be able to do that. Uh, a lot of the times I want to do quite complex segmentations, so that would require me to build a search screen every time, which would require a developer. I'm not a developer, I can write some bad SQL though. Um, so we created a system called uh, SQL Smart Groups. Uh, let's have a look, where are we? Manage Groups. Um, so what you do in your first instance is create a broadest smart group that you can. So I can say, give me everyone who's donated to the London Bikeathon campaign as my initial smart group. And then I can paste in some SQL at the bottom of that that says uh, adds in an additional clause. Uh, so I go 100. There we are. So Birmingham, is that the one I want? 50 miles? No, I don't want that one. E-News 100, there we are. So if I bring up the smart group in the settings here, I can customize my smart group. Ignore the top bit. I don't understand what that means. Um, but I can paste in my extra clause here. And I know enough about the table structure to be able to do that. So I can say, well, actually, yes, they've donated that campaign, but they must have hit the aggregate of 100 pounds, and they must not have received this email already and everything else. And I can then create really, really complicated groups. You've got to be careful with them. It's very easy to have too broad a section, the first smart group, 
and then you start to hang your system, which we've done. Um, so it's trying to, you need to narrow it down as much as you can in the first instance. Um, I think this is available as an extension, Pavez? Is this available? Is he here? Deepak? Anyone? Invader? <laughs> no. <laughs> Deepak, is this available online? C++ smart groups, is it on your GitHub? <coughs> There we are. You can go to Vader GitHub and, and get it. Um, I'll show you a couple of the emails, just from a sort of marketing perspective. Uh, email, automated email. And the other thing we do it for is welcome series. So when someone signs up for a direct debit, uh, we've got a welcome series of emails that goes out. Uh, another customization we've done is marketing or transactional. So that means that should you obey the mailing blocks or not? So the e email marketing laws in this country says you can send a transactional email to somebody, say a receipt for something. That means I can ignore no bulk mails. But if it's a marketing email, I want to pay attention to the bulk mail block. So I can choose here whether I should be listening to that block or not. Uh, we also send it via CV mail, which allows us to track opens and clicks, rather than the built-in system. There's another customization we've done. Um, it looks funny here. There's loads of gaps in it. It doesn't look like this when it goes out. So this is just an, a one that gets sent to direct debit givers, saying thanks for helping us beat blood cancer. The next one says other ways you can get involved. The third one might say, you know, come to this event. Um, show you one of the hundred pound ones when I'm done. Wear it with pride, your cycling jersey, you know, you've hit your target, well done, fill out this form, that's a web form CV, so that goes back onto their contact record to say they've got that, and then we just extract that and send the jerseys out. Cool, thanks. I'm going to uh, show an extension which I've developed for an organization uh, which we work with. This extension is not yet on the extension directory of CVCRM. But I thought this is quite nice to show you anyway. So it might uh, appear on the extension directory uh, sooner or later. An extension is about uh, documents in CVCRM. Um, what this organization wanted, they want to store uh, documents or letters that have written in Word or PDFs or uh, any documents or any correspondence. Uh, they want to store that at the contact level. Uh, first of all, we get a lot of notices. This is because it's the test environment, which isn't the most clean environment. So we just ignore them and we go down till we have our contact screen. Um, and what we have done in this extension is uh, we have made a tab on the contact dashboard which says documents. And it's quite easy. You can add a new document. And then you have to can upload a PDF, a Word document, a spreadsheet or anything you want to upload. Um, you can download one if there is one in the system. And you can uh, also see so, uh, different versions of the same document. So I'm not sure if there are versions of this document, but you will see. And what we see here is that we have uh, two versions of the same document. And then we can download each version separately, or we can upload a new version. Um, if we upload one, Uh, we can choose then a file, so we can just completely replace um, by another file. We can add a description, and we could say if we want to replace the current version. So, for example, if you just uploaded a file and you thought, oh, wait, hang on a moment, this is not really a new version, I've just forgot a typo or something, you can upload the new one and replace the current version.
what we also have done uh, is that, um, let me see, we can also add documents on a case. And I will just open a case and hope it goes well. And this is all in CV 4.4. Uh, and the cases have been redone in 4.5, so I'm not sure if this part will still work in 4.5. But you can try, and then if you are a developer, you can change it and make it compatible. Mm. So if you are familiar with the cases, you see now here the, the manage case screen. And what we have uh, here is a new tab saying documents, which works quite similar to the documents on, on the contact dashboard. You can then uh, add extra context for who this document is valid for. You can add a subject for the document. And you can upload your file, and that's basically it for this document extension. So, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Kurun Jalmi. Uh, besides being part of uh, CV Core team, I also work for organization uh, uh, Web Access, which does a lot of CV consulting also. So, uh, here's the one extension that we developed, which simplifies the walk list creation process. So I'm not going to talk much and just show you this video. So you log in, you click on this map context, you get this nice angular based response you screen, you select this script, there's few filter criteria we are based on that you get this contact in this area. You filter further. You can use the filter. Simplifies the interface. You got, then you just click on one of the. So this is a place where there's multiple contacts in the same household or same address. So it just shows that a lot of people are there. Then you can just use the drawing tool. Say, okay, I want to map this contact, create a walk list for this region and click on this and click save. And since we are developer, we always show this validation message just to make sure everything works. Clear the section, maybe draw again. So this kind of helps so that you can select based on your how terrain or geographical region of your walk list creation process. So you just create. Save, group has been created, and you can use create walk list or survey from this process. That's it. Thank you. So I wanted to talk to you about an exciting subject, European elections, and uh, how we had uh, 12 NGOs that worked together and uh, that tried with 100 volunteers to gather all the contact details uh, of all the candidates so they could contact them and ask them to send, sign their pledge. And, uh, oops, cable. And what we did was to use visualization to help us to know where we were and to help them communicate about what was happening for their campaign. And we have used a wonderful visualization framework that was part of the Google Summer of Code that's uh, CVisualize, 
And uh, so that's the curve, that's the number of candidates. So at the beginning, we had a few that were previously MEPs, and then it grew slowly, and then the campaign in March started to take off and slowly rise until we got uh, 6,000 candidates. And that's how they are spread among countries and among political groups, and that's some kind of quality control, being able to filter only the candidates that have mails, only candidates that have Facebook, and so we know if the data we have is complete enough or not. Then we could use, and we did that daily, we, can, we could use, say, we are only interested by what's happening in the UK. So we filter, and oh, in the UK, we had a lot of contacts that were added at the start, and then slow growth. Then we could zoom, saying only UK, that came at the end. Oh, at the end, and then we could visualize that it was mostly the Lib Dem that were added at the end. So we used that as a tool to track where we are and how many candidates we had. We added, so that was the general view, and we had the same for each of the campaign. So that one is, Uh, that's an, that's Ilga Europe, an LGBT organization, and they had a pledge asking the candidates to promote LGBT rights. And so that they were following what was going on. So that's the same, but only the candidates that sign. And that's the same. They tracked and they were looking at the end. What happened? That was mostly those that were without group or the socialist, and mostly from Spain. And then they could filter and have the list and then tweet to them directly some message, some support, some thank you. And <coughs> that was for them, for the back office, to know what was going on, to be able to know, oh, actually, we don't have enough candidates or we don't have enough signatures in that country. We need to push our local contacts. And from the same that data, up, they had that on their website. So that's a simplified but nicer looking visualization. That's all the same data visualization framework that's part of CVCRM uh, extension. And then you can filter, say, I'm only interested by France. And then you have the list of candidates in France. And then you can filter, I'm only interested by the Greens. And you have the list and so on. And then you can filter, saying, I'm only interested to see which one were elected at the end. And that's the result. And the last thing we did, which isn't a visualization per se, but that's a tool to make it easier for all these 100 um, volunteers to do the data entry, was a simplified screen. So instead of having to go the usual CV way, create new contact or using profile, we did that as a grid. So they could, oops. They could just click add and add one, and that would be added. Or they could directly modify, saying, oh, actually, now I have the Facebook of that person, and I can just add and save it. So it was much faster. And then they could filter. I'm only working for the Lib Dem in the UK. I filter that down, and I focus on that one, because that's my task as a volunteer. And they could work much faster with this interface. You stay on the same page. You do the data entry, and you see the result directly. So that was what we did, what they did for a few months for the European elections. That's it. I need a microphone. Cool, hey. Um, so uh, my name's Jamie Novick, I'm here from CompuCorp. Um, I just thought I'd show you a couple of extensions that are either out there, on the, uh, out there on the extensions directory or ones that will shortly be out there on the extensions directory for you guys to go and check out that we've produced. Um, so the first two are around mailing. Um, so if anybody came to the, uh, the mailing uh, session that we did yesterday, then you will have seen these already, but just for everybody else's benefit. So the first one is an integration with uh, Mailjet. Um, so Mailjet are a 
service provider for SMTP Relay, so you can fire off all your emails through uh, Mailjet. Um, sometimes setting up um, mailing with Civi CRM can be a little bit complicated. Um, this simplifies all of that stuff. Install the extension, uh, plug in the API key, sign up for, sorry, sign up for a, an account with Mailjet, plug in your API key, uh, and they'll fire out, all your, fire out all your mails, and then they'll come back into you guys, uh, come back into your Civi CRM um, so through the API. So you can check that out. Um, it's also uh, not particularly expensive, especially at the, the lower levels there, so maybe about five pound a month for 30,000 emails. It makes your life uh, much easier if you're using mailing for Civi. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one, and I can just see the guys there from the, from the ATL at the back there, give us a wave, we funded this as well, thank you very much, uh, is Simple Mail. Uh, so again, showed this yesterday. Um, it's a slightly different mailing wizard uh, for Civi CRM, which basically forces your uh, staff uh, to put mails into a, a particular shape so that they can't end up with marketing emails which go all everywhere. Uh, so just walking through, it's got a nice uh, new wizard which is written in a, a new technology known as Angular. So Robin, if you want to put your hand up and give a little wave, he's been working on it. Is he here or is he? Now he's in the other room preparing for another session, so that's great. <laughs> uh, so you can just see the wizard here. Um, you're able to select a header image, uh, put some more details about your email in here, and then magically, that's almost by magic, you'll see that it will format you a nice email based on the stuff that you've put in, so that even, even the most basic of staff members should be able to put out an absolutely perfect looking email blast. So that's number two. Uh, and number three, if I can get to it, uh, this one's mainly for membership organisations. So uh, I don't do just a quick show of hands. How many membership organisations here sometimes do members-only events? Okay, so that's, that's quite a few of you guys. Um, so this is an extension um, which allows you to, with a little bit of configuration. set up uh, events which can only be accessed by members. So there is some stuff that you can do out of the box and to do that with Civi, but this stuff actually allows you to have a little bit more control over it. Um, it also allows you to do a members and non-member event, if you can get your head around that concept. Um, that means that members are allowed to bring non-members and pay a different ticket price for them. Um, so how does that kind of all translate? It means that when somebody signs up, uh, where am I going? Uh, hang on, maybe it's this one, test event, yeah. When somebody signs up, uh, they have to be logged in first, so we know they're a member. They log into the site, um, and if you can see Mateus, he did all the theming for all this, so he'll be at the back there. Oh, I need to put in some credit card details, one second. Um, da, da, da. Give me a number. Go with you. Oh. Put some rubbish in here. Put some rubbish in there. Some more rubbish. Further bit of rubbish. Uh, yeah, just give me a country, please. That'll do. Okay. United States Armed Forces Europe. <laughs> I'm going to question that. Um, so here you can either select a member ticket, and if you do, uh, oh no, sorry, I've got to tick this box. Oh, bear with me, guys. God, I hate online forms. <laughs> uh, an added complexity for this was that the client um, wanted us to clear the form after every time you, if you go back. So it made testing it much worse once it implemented that feature. So that if, if somebody was to walk away from the laptop having put their credit card details in, uh, but not having completed the payment, their credit card details wouldn't still be in the form. So fair enough. Uh, some stuff there. Oh, something's disappeared. No. Oh, no. What have I done? <laughs> what have I done? Well, uh, okay, I've ticked a box. I've done a security code. Uh, I promise it's the last go, guys. So, Jamie. 
Okay. Some streets and some bugs being shown as well. Country, right, we need a country. United States. We need a province. Something's going on with that. EF, blah, 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 blah. Can I continue? Is it, yeah, ready? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please. Oh, no, <laughs> I can't show it's not set up for that. Uh, there would be another form where you can enter in the member's ID if you want to buy a member's ticket. That's it, guys, I'm not going to hold you anymore. <laughs> Cheers. We have finished the lighting talks. So thanks again to all the speakers. If you can just rise and... Can just